Let's do a little oral history. This is why I'm recording. This is my youngest son, Jason, on uh, the phone, oh. visiting us from Vermont. And uh, oral history is really important. And, you know, because we forget sometimes that history is about people and lived experience. And we have gems among us sometimes uh, that we don't notice. And when I when I bumped into Patrick at a friend's house in Woodstock and, and we were talking, and I learned that you had a brother, right? George. You had a brother? Yeah, man. <laughs> and I realized the cut from the same cloth, it was obvious, the same DNA. And I figured I, I, I know he's got a lot to share with us, and he's got a lot to share about the city and about education, his life experience, and his thoughts that new teachers uh, should take with them and, and consider in guiding their practice. And um, um, and he agreed to come, and I, I was I was tickled pink that that Patrick decided to come. I just wanted to do, to share with you some of the words of wisdom of, of a tiny piece of a poem written by Alice in Wonderland. Ah, oh, my favorite chick. Who's a character that exists between his two ears. And uh, and I just realized what a time capsule he is. And and I have also on here, in case you're interested in doing something like this, oral history standards, there is a protocol, of course. And of course, I'm breaking all the rules. But Good. anyway, it's here. If you ever want to bring someone in from your neighborhood and your family to talk to the class. But let me just give you a piece of this and then uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick. Inspiration and meditation, a mighty combination. Inspiration ain't worth defecation without meditation. Meditation without inspiration is fun, but a vexation. Meditation nourishes inspiration, offering salvation. Fortified by meditation, with perspiration as lubrication, inspiration becomes illumination, bringing clarification to a bogus situation. Let's have a standing ovation for this trio that brings elation. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Carlin. Yeah. Thank you, man. And at the end of that, at the end of that, she wants to go to a place where there's a whole lot of good vegetation. Oh. <laughs> so I think we know where that's at. And uh, I'm so happy to talk to you guys today, I gotta tell you, man. Because uh, from what I understand, you're going out, my, my older son was ADHD or whatever the hell it is, and uh, special ed the whole scene and all. And the teachers were good people to him. I, my hair stands up a little bit because, <sighs> God damn, I didn't want to get like this. But I'm proud of every person in this room every person in this room makes me feel good because you want to help kids and uh, I like that and uh, I don't think helping kids is a whole lot of rule shit I never got along good with rules and things like that and it caused a lot of trouble and it happens to my son he got up to go see the, the little pig or some shit and they laid an ADHD on him and that was the end of him and uh, he definitely was learning disabled and shit like that. There's no doubt about it. Uh, some of you, I guess, are going to be getting in from what I hear, uh, talking to kids in what they call the inner city and all this bullshit. And uh, they're all kids, man, different colors. This guy's color, my color, her color. They're, we're all different colors, man, and don't mean shit. Uh, George and I were lucky to grow up a couple of blocks from Harlem. So uh, we're totally at ease with everybody. I don't care where you're from or what you're doing. As long as you ain't bothering me, we're all cool together. And with people that are going to be out talking to the kids, the main thing I would like to tell you all is just keep your sense of humor. And, in, you know, because some of us are not there to learn. I was just a total asshole. I was not learning disabled. 
I didn't need any help. I was just a nasty little son of a bitch. <laughs> didn't want to be in school, man. I did not want it. I felt it was like prison. I knew I could quit when I was 16. I got kicked out of second grade for calling a nun a son of a bitch and bastard, okay? That was a bad start. And uh, they take me to a shrink, and he tells my mother, he's just a bad boy, Mrs. Carlin, and he should be sent away to get male discipline. You know, and every night my father is spanking the shit out of me because I don't finish my plate, and he comes home drunk. The guy was an asshole, and I wouldn't cry for him and shit like that, so we didn't get along. And uh, that didn't bother me. I learned from the elevator man, I learned from the garbage man, I learned from the, the door man. We were, I was rich for the first five years of my life, and they were the worst five of all. So if you're going to places where people don't have a lot of money, I got $2 on me right now and six quarters and uh, no cards or shit like that. I don't care, that shit's not important. What's important is you communicating with the people in your class. And I think of the guy that went and taught to Vinnie Barbarino and uh, Fuentes and all the guys that weren't really wanting to learn, and he got through to them. So if I was gonna do a class, I would call it Practical Reality 101. And I would say, welcome to Practical Reality 101. Any of you that are getting ready to copy down your homework assignments, forget that shit. We don't do homework. Oh, by the way, you have all passed for the year. You all got passing grades? You got no homework. Now let's settle down and learn from one another. Now I understand that from what I hear, I'm reading your things here, I see words that don't startle me. I see the same words that I saw, contrary, willful, Bad, okay, that's not your fault, that's how you are, you don't like how things are presented. You look like you're very good with those keyboards, I read about you with the keyboards. I want you to help my buddy here. He is very good at the art stuff and all, but he's not into the tech stuff. You guys try and work together, and if you can work with a guy, I want you all to work together. We're not competing. I don't want you to be looking for a 98 and you to be sad because you got a 99. I want you to cooperate with one another. I want you to work as a unit. We're not competing, we're all here to learn. Number one, I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna learn just from talking to you guys. So now you got, you got no homework, you pass for the year. I don't have a detention pass. I got no slips for detention. I'll never send any of you to detention. I got a nice big cut slip book you need a cut, you gotta go and get a bridal gown with your older sister or something, you can't be in Thursday? Cool thing, here's your cut slip. We'll get along together, we'll help one another. And that's the kind of class I would like. The only thing I ask for on, on tripping of rules is no bullying of any kind. No bullying, physical stuff, big burly dudes, bothering little skinny guys, none of that crap. And None of that cyberbullying that I hear about. We're not here about that kind of shit. We're here about getting together and helping ourselves. And none of you are here because you're sons and daughters of millionaires. So you care about your neighborhoods, you care about the people you ride the A train with or the D train as I took. You care about the other people, you care about your neighborhood, you care about learning. You know, the guy that looks insignificant might be your lawyer three years from now. Keep you out of Rikers. So, you know, pay attention. I've been down these trails. I've been down these trails, man. I'm not talking about shit I don't know. I had buddies who did two turns and sing, sing. I had a buddy who was the head con up there. The head con. And he was doing a second thing because he was just a silly guy. He was a beautiful guy, Danny, but he was silly. He was silly, and he liked doing armed robberies. That was his thing. I liked doing them. I thought, Danny, she's... But he had a father that used to beat the shit out of him every day. The father was a loan enforcer at the docks, okay? And we went and saw him and they said, everybody paid Big Dan. That was Danny's dad. And when Danny got, I'm getting goose pimples, think about this guy. When Danny was 12, the dad says, you're too big for just very and From now on, we go to Nux. The guy wound up in Sing Sing, isn't that amazing? 90% of the people doing time are there because of brutal parents and their kids that they didn't want and shit like that. So be compassionate in your teaching. 
if a guy you think has a great potential is doing shitty, there's a reason for it. He's a tortured soul. And you're good people, you wouldn't be here wanting to teach people. So relax and enjoy yourselves. And uh, learn from what really happened. My mother, I'll go back into the history tripping here. I'm going to do the 20th century for you in about 10 sentences. Very simple era. But it started for me in 1896 when my mother was born. 1896. And her father was a cop, an Irish cop, when the Irish were about as popular as the Puerto Ricans about 20 years ago when they first started coming up here and they had all the slurs and all the shit. But I'll tell you a nice thing, he was a gentle dude, Dennis Beery. I took his name for confirmation. I named my second child Dennis. George got a middle name, George Dennis Carlin, all because of Dennis Beery, an Irish cop who did not drink alcohol. Irish and alcohol, <laughs> bum, bad combination. He didn't do that and he never hit his kids, okay? So here he is being a copper and being hated, and this guy used to rag him all the time. And Dennis had a gentle demeanor about him, and he was a real intellectual. He copied all of Shakespeare because he wanted to. This is back when my mother was a little girl. All right, so he's in the locker room. He's in the locker room, and there's always a locker bully. There's always a locker room bully. And he mistook Dennis's mild manner for that, that Dennis was some kind of a pussy. Well, that was a wrong assumption because Dennis comes in one afternoon after being called a harp and a mick and a donkey, and he comes in and this dude is buffing up his shoes with a shirt that Dennis's wife, Mary O'Grady, had ironed for him. And this guy had a fucking death wish. Trust me on a death wish. This ignorant asshole, Dennis says, is that my shirt? And he says, yeah. And he bumped it up. He bumped up his shirt. He says, I only wish it was the Irish flag. Whoa. Crack! Broken jaw, motherfucker. Broken fucking jaw. All the way across the room. On his ass. And Dennis got no reprimand. No reprimand. And he said, he would hold up his hand and he said, in 17 years on the force, Pat, I never had to use my gun or my club. I could always get him to come along. And he had heart right. and he had soul. And he brought up beautiful children. And my mother was one of them. And she had guts. She had guts. She got kicked out of the cab. You know, I used to like it because she thought George and I were assholes, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was like she didn't do that shit. Bullshit. She got kicked out of Catholic school. <laughs> kicked out of Catholic school way back then. And, uh, and she had too much bracelets, too much lipstick, shit like that, you're out. So she goes out and they send her to Washington Irving. All Jews, whole class Jews. And here come this one Irish girl, class president. They dug her, they dug her, because she was real. Oh, by the way, she didn't get invited to a party took a nice Louis Sherry candy box and shit. Back in her day, the horses used to deliver a lot of stuff. There were many droppings of horse shit uh -huh. all around. Put the horse shit in the candy box, went over to the party and gave shit to the mom. <laughs> so that was my mom. And she gets out of that school. Now here's where, keep your balls big, all of you, and the things that you ask for. Don't be afraid to ask for what you want. And she goes and gets out of this high school, and goes for six months to the uh, typing and stenography. And this is back like World War I. This is ancient history. Oh, I forgot the little one was here, and I'm doing the awful words. But we always did those words with our kids since they were little. So Yeah, yeah. I gave a trigger warning. I said extra salty. Oh, oh, good girl. I love you. Good girl. Yeah, and that's cool. And we try not to turn too crazy, but, but she gets in there. She decides now, she's had six months of business school. Well, it's time to go to work. Time to go to work. Well, the average young lady getting out of a school like that, they go and they answer their job wanted type this and that. Not her. She goes to editor and publisher magazine. It's back in like maybe 1918 or something. And she puts an ad in position wanted executive secretary. 
and that's all the girl ever worked at her whole life. First job she got was with Cecil Presbury, a very respected ad agency, and she got her gig as that, that, boom, boom, blah, blah. She said, I couldn't be bothered with the steno pool. So think as big as you guys want. Think as big as you want. Yeah, I want to I wanna run the athletic program. Well, what do you know about football? Nothing, man. But I know how to motivate the players and get them going. And I got brains enough to feed them bee pollen at halftime. No coach yet in NFL or colleges or nothing knows what I know about halftime. Because if I'm running a team and it's halftime, every dude on that team is going to hit up two tablespoons of bee pollen. It's not a banned substance. You will get, it ain't a banned substance, but they would, if they knew how good it was, they'd ban it. <laughs> but it'll get you, it'll give you the energy and the trip. Your, your team will win more games doing bee pollen than not. But don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Step up and they'll say, hey, you're nuts. You've got to have three years here before you get that. Okay, I'll be cool. I'll wait. But meanwhile, I'm thinking about this and that. So keep what you're doing. Stay with what you're at. Think of my mom. Now, I say she's tough. She was only five foot tall. But when she would look at you and say, listen, you, oh, that was a different day. It was all over for you there because Mary Beery was pissed off. And you've got to be that way and make your demands on what you want. But I do love what you're doing, and I respect all of you for doing it. And uh, I'll answer any questions or stuff, whatever you guys yeah. got. I'll tell you stories about her. She can tell you stories about getting shot. And think, 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 think. Here's a dude. She, uh, she knew all about ad agencies. She worked there in Lexington Avenue. You're near uh, the Chrysler Building and stuff. Y and R or BBD and O, one of these big outfits. Needs him, a guy, and it was a plush thing coming in. Everybody knew about it, and the line was outside the Chrysler building all the way up Lax and stuff. And this young dude walks up and he says, Oh, wow. Goes and has a nice breakfast, goes next door to uh, Western Union. I guess they don't have them no more, but sends the guy a telegram, the interviewer. <laughs> interviewer goes, Yeah, next, all right, thanks for you. Leave this, leave that. Finally, and this guy is on the end of the line. This guy finally gets on my, he's on the end of the line. You show oh, you later, go get ahead of me. Oh, you, no, nah, go ahead, you two, you, you guys can get ahead of me. And then he gets up to where the dude is interviewing, and the guy looks at him, and he says, are you the guy who sent the telegram? And he says, yep. And he says, you're hired. <laughs> Isn't that a nice easy one? He sent a telegram that said, Hire no one until you speak to me. I'll be at the end of the line. <laughs> ka -ching, you're hired. So these are people that think what they're doing. And when we split from my dad, because he was a jack off, uh, she had to go back to work and she was in her 40s. And she goes, my aunt gets her an interview at Hearst Magazine, because my aunt worked for a uh, legal department, legal secretary, real good type. You know. And my mom gets this interview, and the dude is for the vice president of Cosmopolitan or Good House, I forget which one. And he says, oh, and then he says, well, by the way, uh, my present girl uh, does buy stocks and bonds. Can you do that? And Mary says, oh, he, she said, well, she can teach me, right? She was the only one who didn't say no. They had girls there from Swarthmore, Amherst, all this crap and stuff. Oh, we never learned about the stocks and bonds. Common sense, your present secretary is doing this, then I'll have her show me. And she got the gig. And we needed it. It was 1938. My brother was about a half a year old. It was still the 30s. It was still depression time. You mean you guys missed a whole lot of crazy stuff? The 30s. The 30s were what I call hard boiled. You know, the big trip had ended, uh, crashing in the stock. All the right people bailed out early and stuff. The only ones who got hurt were the small ones and stuff. John D. Rockefeller said, uh, uh, not, not Rockefeller, the other guy, Morgan. J.P. Morgan, the Chase thing. Uh, well, he didn't get hurt in it. You know why? Because he said, one morning, guess what did you say? I took all my money out of, out of uh, I took all my money out of stock. Gee, why did you do that? He said, well, I got a tip from the elevator man on the stock this morning. That means it's the end of the show. Mm -hmm. 
The carnival's ready to leave town, man, when the elevator can tell you. The elevator guy gonna tell you who to buy to make money in the stock market. So a lot of the smart money extracted themselves and all the rest of us were poor. Everybody else was poor. It was that simple, man. Guys were lined up five deep. Listen to Spanky singing a song. Spanky and our gang, beautiful girl. Listen to her sing a song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Once I built a railroad, ba do dee da 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 Brother, can you spare a dime? The guy was there, he was there to go to World War I, he was there to do all this shit, but now he's hungry, but the other guys ain't hurting. The whole time these people were hungry, you had people on Park Avenue going around in tuxedos and doing shit. What am I, nuts? It was Ian Parker. That was, that was life, that was life. That was what I call the hard-boiled 30s. And the guy's calling, I listen, sister, he'd be, be, be talking, shut up, sister, and girly, and stuff like that. And the girl look at him, you big, it was wonderful. The people talked hard, they lived hard, they lived on uh, small rations, the families were tight and hung together. When my Uncle John wouldn't have a job, he could crash on the couch, because my mother and my aunt had gigs, and then when he got a gig, he would be back and he would help Frank, and Frank always had something to do, and he was a chauffeur. And you, 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 there's only two kinds of people in the world. I hate to sound like a commie, but there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are the people who have too much money. It's, it's too much money! What do you, 140 billion? Get away from me! That, I can't even think of a number like that. Why do you have that much? Oh, Jim and me, we ain't got jack shit. We're hoping we can buy a bus ticket. But it's always, it that went back to King days and it went back to the other thing. God said that I'm the king. God said I'm the king. Uh, you know, and, and they, just, they just run it. So this is why I get into the brotherhood trip. It's just a sensible thing. I don't mean to do shit. I just let shit happen to my life. And it works out so far so good, I envision. But uh, the brotherhood trip is this. The really controlling people, the really top echelon people, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, the ones who were the real barons, they didn't want anyone like us knowing anything. They wanted workers. And even when they were putting their library together, my, my son Dennis came and we looked at the documentary. They said, we don't need artists, we don't need musicians, we don't need writers, we need workers, keep those. They just wanted books that wouldn't stir your imagination and shit. You people all have beautiful imaginations. I know that. I know that without anyone telling me that. I know you think about wonderful things. And if you're lucky, you write them down and, and they help. And you got all these people with too much and all these people with too little. The rest of us are all scuffling. It's that simple. And the reason that happens is because we are able to be manipulated and divided. And I live up by Woodstock, and I know guys who resent worker dues, worker dues, who say, well, all our taxes go to the city. Your taxes go to, yeah, listen, man. The city taxes and the stuff people pay goes down. The people in Wyoming get back more than they pay in the stuff. The people in New York and California get it right up. That's the way it is. That's life. But it, you must, you must not allow these manipulators to pit you one against the other. Like they're doing with these, uh, there's a Muslim chick and a couple of, uh, the Puerto Rican chick, I love her, AOC from the Bronx, <laughs> up your root, baby. They despise that girl because she talks right up. And she was a barmaid, man. And she knows what life is about, man. And the thing is, as long as you're going to let people think you, you've got people that think that, uh, I, I was stationed with them, I was stationed with guys that, that uh, when I was first in the service, it was just getting to be people integrating them all around 1950. And there were guys who had never seen a black person. I would, I would never seen them, bro, there you go, bro. And, uh, but as we got to know one another and stuff, when I was in Alaska, we, I had country dudes, country dudes, listening to Billy Ward and the Dominoes, man. What they're saying isn't so, yeah, ah! And right behind that, Hank Snow, or a guy like uh, 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 Hank Williams, and mixing the country and the rhythm and blues and the square tunes, and the square tunes, man. And uh, the, the music was a real, a real beneficial thing. And 
once you understand that the the poor Appalachian guy, who's his job is gone. They come and they take the coal and shit. And they leave the guy on a piece of ground. They have places where the guy's surrounded by shit that they dug out so that the Koch brothers can be billionaires. You know, hey, fuck the Koch brothers, man. And I gotta tell you, I got a, I got a movie out. <laughs> and you get everybody, when I was a limo driver, everybody had a screenplay or two. And other guys doing voiceovers and shit, because everybody's scrambling and wanting something nice to happen. But I got a thing out called Snail O the Sailor. And I'm trying to get someone to do it. And the Coke Sucker Brothers, I name them the Coke Sucker Brothers, they get what's coming to them from the real people. And I got gang guys, I got gang guys and shit defending Snailo, who knows all this good electrical stuff like Tesla and things like that. He's going to get free electricity for the people. So they want to wipe him out. And I got the gang guys picking him up on the way to the airport and kicking the shit out of those uh, guys that they make of the troopers. The, the Black Watch or whatever they call them, they're like commandos for the right wing. And uh, as long as they can make this guy from West by God, Virginia, not know that he's as poor as a guy in the inner city and not know a brother when he sees one, they can rule. So what has to happen is people have to spread their own awareness. You have to spread your own awareness and you have to speak up when shit is wrong. And you have to, when you get the kids in your class, you're gonna get an assortment. I'm sure. You, you all, all you guys did a year somewhere. What did you find in your classes? Black, white, brown, everybody together? Some some could speak good Spanish. Let me tell you, that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm an Irish asshole. I'm as Irish as you can be, man. And when the Puerto Ricans came to my neighborhood, I was working for a guy named Ramon. Hey, Ramon, and he couldn't say two sentences without saying, Coño, Coño, Patricio. Oh, yeah, hey. and he hit his head and he got corajo. And, and his, his nephews were teaching me the mambo. Uh, and this is 19, like 40, when, when Puerto Ricans were yeah. first coming in yeah. and everybody hated them. Everybody say? hated the Puerto Ricans and shit. And I learned a curse word that was so good. And I got it, I got it in one of the ones that uh, they, the, the cops would go and bust them. So I got a thing happening in Snello. Because I lay the brotherhood shit in there a lot because I just love it. I grew up that way. I don't give a shit. It was black guys who taught me that a hard six is two rows of rabbit shit. <laughs> yeah, man, three out three. And uh, we'd have the crap game every Sunday, man. And we didn't give a shit what color you were as long as you had green money. And, uh, it was fun shit, and it was fun growing up that way, and I'd like to introduce that realism, you know, to the rest of the world. So, it just it just crops up, and uh, I hope that you uh, have a lot of fun out there doing it. And uh, I love you all, and I'll take any kind of questions and stuff like that, and I'll talk about my brother, who was so wonderful and discovered Reefer at 13. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> And let me tell you, it, it saved my life. It saved my life. I'll talk about reefer. I don't care. It should be legal. Uh, Irish are like uh, Indians, Irish and, and Indians. Alcohol is just a bad thing to us. And we have to recognize that. And I think that when, you know, Sitting Bull and those guys are smoking that peace pipe, I think the, the, the thing was not tobacco. I think they had some good ganja. <laughs> yeah, yeah because it, it freed my brain up. It freed my brain, bro. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it did, it did. Oh man, it did. In 1956, and I'm, I'm, like a, I'm like a right wing asshole. I went to Cardinal Hayes High School in Bronx. Deo et patria, God and country and all that. I was a gung-ho dude, man. I hear my brother, a lefty. My brother's a lefty and he comes out to town there and he's got a good gig. He says, I get $750 a week for being the hippy dippy weatherman. I said, oh wow. Yeah, and he said, I get another 700. I said, wow, holy shit, you got a lot of bread. He said, yeah, I got lots of bread, man. Look at this, Panama red. And I had bumped into reefer now and then. Yeah. I had bumped into reefer now and then, but you cannot get into reefer if you're doing alcohol. I found, I know this shit because I did this shit. So it's not like I'm reading something to you from a book that Cervantes wrote. 
and uh, I'm looking at the real thing. I would drink alcohol, I would go to jail. Mm -hmm. That was simple, that. because why? I was already an asshole. I didn't need alcohol <laughs> to make a bigger asshole. It's crazy. So here I am, and I, I decided to quit drinking after my second 502, drunk driving. And I said, you know, man, I said, maybe you shouldn't be drinking that alcohol shit. I got scar tissue, broken beer bottle, me and a buddy fought a whole Irish bar. That was dumb. And I threw the first fucking punch. I was dumber. <laughs> but you learn. You learn, man. And I said, I'm going to quit this alcohol shit. And I did. So when my brother comes out, uh, I'm, I'm clean. I hadn't done nothing for two years. Now I smoke this Panama Red. And we're cruising around, and I am loaded. And I hear, you got a lot of nerve to call yourself my friend. When I was down, you just stood there grinning. Bob Dylan, singing about a bad scene and how things were. And I said to George, I said, Jesus Christ, George, that guy's singing about me. And I became an instant lefty. Instant lefty. Bob man. Dylan and weed. Huh? Bob Dylan and weed freed my brain. And other times it, it just didn't work. Like in the real olden days, back in 1949 was the first time I touched reefer. And it was, uh, I was drinking at the 500 Club, 500, 125th Street by Amsterdam. And it was a black bar. And we were Irish kids, but we were hip Irish kids from the neighborhood. We weren't Columbia University jack offs or nothing. We were street kids. So we were as welcome in the black bar as everybody else. And I'm listening to things like, had a date the other night with little Lucy Brown, went to all the honky tonks and really got around. She's five foot two with eyes of blue and pretty as a queen. I didn't know her pop was a city cop. And she was just 15. Good morning, judge. Why do you look so mean, sir? And these were songs that were just so great. And then pretty ones too, like I need you so to keep me happy. If I can't have you, I cannot go on. By guys like Ivory Joe Hunter. So I was getting all this good music. And plus when I was rich, I had a black maid. I had a black maid who used to take me to Harlem when I was this fucking big. And I could hear uh, Billie Holiday singing Pennies from Heaven from the jukebox, from the speakers that you see in the 1930s movies. The 30s were okay. I learned a lot of good shit, I got into good music. But here's the funny thing, I love people with a sense of humor. The bartender says to me and Joey Phillips and, uh, and Davey, he says, you guys wanna go drinking in an after hours joint? And we said, yeah, okay, cool. He takes us over to the, from the 500 Club, which was, we were like an Irish neighborhood right up against Harlem. And he says, uh, we go over to 115th and 5th Avenue in Harlem. I don't know if you know anything about it. That is Harlem. And we got a guy outside. He's got a powder blue overcoat, wrap around, big dude. And he's out on the street, and he's checking people out that are coming to go to this after hours joint. And our bartender comes up, and he's got these three Irish guys, and he says, I got three of the ink spots here with me. <laughs> we were in the ball. We were in there. So I was full of gin and beer, because I used to drink double gins with a beer chaser. You get drunk quicker that way, you go to jail quicker. <laughs> and uh, I was pretty lushed up, and I go in the can to take a leak, and this one dude hand me a J, and I'm that, that shit don't do nothing for me, man. That shit don't do nothing. I'm up in Frisco, and I'm stationed up there. Paul Desmond, fucking uh, sax player for uh, Dave Brubeck, Dave yeah. Brubeck and shit. Me and my buddy are outside the downbeat, and they were killing a J, and he hands over a J to me. And I said, but I was drunk, man, I never took. But when I was away from the alcohol, the reefer made my brain blossom, and started me writing. I see a man in the back here who knows about the ganja trip. <laughs> <laughs> wonders for my brother George. It saved my life. I don't know how much I've saved on just fucking bail money. Uh, oh, I did get a couple of drug busts. I got a couple of drug busts because it's against the law and shit. But, but what it did for my mind is great. I got a thing here full of all kinds of writing and shit like that that just spills out of you 
when you do the re and I can still take care of business. I can still take care of business. I can still do 40 through that little cornball town when I got 10 pounds or something back there that I don't want to be bothered about. <laughs> you, you still pay attention. You don't get goofy behind it. You don't get goofy behind it. So uh, that's why I got the reefer leaves. I got the reefer leaves. I'm, that's my memento. My memento of my brother. My memento of my brother. And uh, I thank him for everything. I thank him for being my best friend in the world. And I want everyone to please get people that you know that are not cool about it. Sly Stone got a great tune out. Everyday people. Everyday people. Here is a red one who knows like a black. Man, that's that simple. Get off that shit, you're all poor. You all ain't got your shit. <laughs> <laughs> you hate each other, friends. Please, the board. please, get yourselves together. They got a guy in Appalachia, I got, he, he was great. He was from Red Jacket, West by God, Virginia. And he never said nothing but West by God, Virginia. And this guy was a wildie. He had a big scar down here. I don't know how he got it. But he was a re-up from the Marine Corps in 1950 in the Air Force with me. And they said, uh, anybody do anything? Can you play the guitar? Anybody play the piano? Uh, I eat light bulbs. Uh, eat light bulbs. Uh, look at his I eat light bulbs. And, oh, I can eat razor blades, and I can I can blow uh, I can blow far I can blow far out of my mouth. This is my buddy. He's my basic, but he was pretty. He, we were pretty good. We were both good shots. And uh, they said, well, it was, he, he took a light bulb and he broke it, and he took the, the glass part, put it down, and he just I could hear him chewing. He wasn't bullshitting anybody. He was chewing that shit. And uh, he got it done, and then he got, uh, he said, get some bread after chow. I got bread after chow. He soaked it down in lighter fluid, lit it up, put it in his mouth, blew it out and all. And Pete, where he was from, he realized at that time his kinship with the poor in the cities. Way back then. Way back then. He understood. In fact, if you're, you're scuffling and everybody in the family trying to, it, it ain't the same as being like, get the chauffeur over here, I gotta go downtown. Oh yeah, and bring me a turkey. You know, it, it ain't that way. It ain't that way for most of us. And he knew that. So it's a case of letting people know where you're at and trusting people and just loving people for, for being what they are. And it seeped into my writing. None of my writing is about preaching. I got a thing that I, I'm not recommending anybody buy shit here. I'm not here to pimp my book and stuff like that. I wind up giving most of these away. But I do have a thing on the Kindle. I got a thing on the Kindle for $4.99, Quinn's Bar and Grill. And what I did, I had a bunch of short stories that I, I, I wrote. And you can't do nothing with short stories. And I had a bunch of poems and shit that I wrote. You can't do nothing with them. So I smoked a good one. And I said, what am I going to do with this? I said, I'll put them all in the book. I'll, let, I'll have an Irish bartender writing these little memoirs of what happened Friday night in Quinn's Bar and Grill when the two guys came in to hold up an Irish bar on payday night. Does that sound like a smart thing to do? Uh, you want to team up with me? And we'll go up on 25th Street and Broadway and we'll hold up an Irish bar on payday night. First of all, you probably got at least two off-duty cops in the son of a bitch. And they got guns because you got to carry them when you're off. And then you got a whole bunch of people that are naturally hostile, <laughs> fueling up on alcohol. <laughs> you're going to go in and ask them for their watch and shit. Well, one guy got killed. And the other guy wound up with a head as big as a, as a basketball from getting the boot put to him. And that was a regular Friday night at Quinn's. So I got him writing about those things. And I got the girl writing about poetry. And she's running a stash house. And she's got all kinds of reefer there and enough acid to light up the whole East Coast. So she goes on the run. He writes his shit. It all gets there. And underlying all of it, without me meaning to do it, and I know you guys are teachers, so you've got working brains that are in there. Without meaning to do shit, if shit is in you, it comes out anyway. I want every one of you to start keeping a goddamn, just a little scribble journal. Right. Now, a little scribble journal from day to day. I got folded and folded to this shit where you get thoughts, and a lot of them make sense, uh, things that would help the world and all. And eventually you get characters that they fit. And this thing, Quinn's Bar and Grill, 
with these stories about neighborhood on 25th and Broadway, as well as stories about where this girl came from, Kansas, man, where some of the best hippies came from. I hung out with the hippie culture. I hung out in Topanga Canyon. I freaked out. I quit being a car salesman. I grew my hair. I grew my beard. And I said my shit. And I managed a little group and shit. And I know the music. And I was able to share that and, and, and grow from it. While I was growing, I was still learning and other people were learning shit from me. It was wonderful. And we can't lose that change. Please work your students like they're your own. And uh, I just love what you do. Patrick, can yeah. you, do you see an, a lasting influence from the 60s? Today? Absolutely. How do you see that? What do you see? Uh, well, they got one that's a nice one, uh, California School. I thought the guy was a third gen. She was a he was a third generation hippie from up in Washington uh -huh. in a Trans Am, and the chick was in something else, California, and they met in Highway 101. <clears throat> but we all learned from each other, and I like for the city kids uh, to be with the rural kids. Yeah, and it, it's happening, and it happens. The kids going to live in Brooklyn now. They they get going. They, all the millennials get help from their parents. Uh, this is about family. The mill millennials get help from their parents. I get help from my kid. I get help from my kid in California who's working the sound on this show that's coming up on CBS called All Rise. And I got social and my wife gets social and that ain't a whole hell of a lot, but I ain't bitching, I ain't bitching. And Dennis will shoot me like 500 and shit like this. He's my kid. But you know what we did for Dennis and Patrick? We never had, yeah, grounded. Yeah, grounded. Yeah, man. What was the other one? Time out and shit. Blow me. Blow me. <laughs> Blow me to that shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Dennis was 15 and we had come back from Vermont. The mill had closed. The mill had closed in Vermont because $2.30 an hour in the bicentennial year was too fucking much. And they were going to North Carolina for less money. So the mill closed two the weeks 70s. before Christmas, yeah. and Vermonters that I was telling yeah. Jason about, who were real people, not assholes like me who had dropped out and shit like that, and I'm hustling a little reefer on the side and shit. No, these were Vermont people, third and fourth generation people, man. And when we were working at the mill, we were all on food stamps. And we were working, and we were on food stamps, and then they say, too much money, adios amigo. Oh, we go. Let's well, I'm cool. The, I go back to California. I got dealer buddies out there. Yeah. Walter, you've been waiting. Yeah. No, I was curious. You grew up in Harlem, 125th and Broadway. In what year was that? Uh, we moved to 519 West 121st Street in September 1941. 41. And well, but we came from 140th Street, which was just as cool. I was stealing shit from the 5 and 10 when I was like seven years old. I mean, and I had buddies who had a uh, brother and uh, they used to send them up to Elmira and Kaksaki. I had, I had buddies, uh, you know, the, the best buddy was doing time and shit like that. It was a great neighborhood. So how many and houses did you live in? I'm curious. Houses? Yeah, because my mom grew up in the Bronx and I told her she'd be talking, she must have moved 10 times when she was a kid because a new building would pop up. We're moving yeah. there because it was cheaper. Well, you get a little free rent. You get a little free rent in the paint job. And you're nothing, you, you know, you're just out there trying to stay alive. So you get her done. And we moved down there because my mother wanted me to be near Columbia University and hang out with nice kids. And she would say that, you know, she was smart and she was tough, but she was dumb about a whole lot of shit. She actually said to me seriously one day, I said, Mom, I got to take a leak. And she said, oh, why couldn't, you know, when you're with your friends, couldn't you call them fellows instead of guys? And you could say, uh, fellows, excuse me, I've got to take a leak. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got to fucking take a leak. What are you doing? Are you out of your gourd? Are you nuts? I'm down here on the corner playing the dozens, you know. Don't play the dozens because the dozens is a game, but the way I fuck your mother is a goddamn shame. Iron is iron and dust is dust. If it wasn't for your mother's mouth, my cock and rust. And that was just saying hello. That was saying hello. On the corner. <laughs> Shit, you know, I gotta go tinkle. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it in. I'll hold it in. But uh, it was it was a great neighborhood and, and, and I was I thought she wanted me with the kids 
They had kids on my street. I got two kids on my street who are uh, Monsignors. Arthur Dempsey and Dermot Brennan. They are fucking Monsignors in the Catholic Church. <laughs> wow. You know, I didn't hang out with them. I went down to 123rd, <coughs> and my mother always told my friends the scrub. You have to be down there on 23rd hanging with the scrub of Amsterdam Avenue, the Hagens and the Harnbys. I told that to my buddy Hagen and Harnby, they loved it. <laughs> you know, we're scrub. So the neighborhood was cool. The jukeboxes were cool because we were close enough to Harlem where when the music would come, we would get rags to riches by Billy Ward and the Dominoes, not by uh, Tony Bennett, who I love. Who I love, and he has endured, and he got me a lot of pussy in Michigan. Oh, oh, yeah. Because of you, there's a song. Oh, yeah. But uh, I'll tell you, man, you want to learn shit, you listen to my mother and you learn shit. I'm graduating eighth grade, 1944. I'm graduating eighth grade, and I got, uh, I got a bunch of Vaseline in my ducktail hair. I got Vaseline in my ducktail hair. It's 1944. I had declared myself cool when I got into eighth grade, and uh, I'm, I'm going, I'm, now I'm getting ready to graduate, and my mother says, it's time for the sex talks. So she said, I gotta tell you some things about sex. She said, you know there are, uh, there are men, I said, I know, Mom, faggots, I know about that shit. And she said, well, there's also scarlet women. And I said, Jesus Christ, where is this going? You know, I'm in eighth grade, I know all this shit. I said, can you tell me something practical? And she said, well, I can. You're not a good looking boy. Oh, no. I said, whoa. We had two girls waiting that would let you go a little bit. They were Catholics. But you could have fun in the balcony at the Nemo. <laughs> I had them waiting. And a buddy of mine, and I'm thinking, well, oh, shit, you know, I might not be good looking, but I'm going to be in that balcony <laughs> having fun. And she says, uh, she said, all right, I'll tell you three things to do and you'll have just as many girls as the pretty boys. I said, oh, all right, what's that? She said, number one, she said, develop the gift of gab. I said, well, the guys on the corner, they say I am the biggest bullshitter on the corner. Mm -hmm. Call him, what'd you do last night? Come on, start with the bullshit now, what is it? So I said, I got the bullshitting thing done. And she said, keep your fingernails short and clean. I am now 87, I was then 12. These are still short and clean. Even though I'm married 62 years, you still wanna, you don't wanna break the basic rules. So they're there, and then the third thing was learn to dance. And baby, that was the key. Do not do the dance. Twirl that girl around, let her go ape shit out there. Stomp around, do your shit, beam, but you're with the music. Everybody's doing the Lindy. I was doing the Savoy. The, Sa the Lindy people bounced around like in those fucking uh, Richie Cunningham and these people on me. The, the happy days. Yeah, we did the Savoy. The Savoy, you slid the chick out. Wow. Wow. Holy wow. Holy wow. Work, baby. Work. We had songs. We had songs that said work. Work with me, Andy. Let's get it while the getting is good. So good, so good, so good. Dancing gets the job done. It's the entrance to the boudoir. So she did tell me good shit. And I appreciate her for that. And I did get just as nice girlfriends as the pretty boys. Yeah. So girls are funny. I'll tell you about girls. When I was stationed in Michigan, we had a couple, they used to call them hot to trot. Oh, I got three here that are hot to trot. Get to the, whoa, whoa. Down you go, and the girls are in from Saginaw, they're up for a visit. And we brought this guy, this guy was a handsome dude. You know how some guys are just plain fucking handsome. The hair was just right, he was from California. And he, oh, he just, wow, if you were a chick, you think, boy, I'm, you know. But he was an asshole. The dude swam, he swam like this, so that his head was up and wouldn't bother his hair. <laughs> <laughs> so sure, we had these three chicks, and me and my buddy Pip, and the one with him when we were getting ready to go back to the base, I said, Will you, could you bring back someone else instead of him? And I said, oh, I think I can. I brought back Johnny Rapaski, a Polish guy from Cleveland, who used, this is 1951 and 52. He used to wear a latex bathing suit with leopard skin. It looked like a leopard skin thing, 
and he'd say, let's go on beach patrol, Pat. And he was just, you went, whoever he got, you knew you could bang her girlfriend. It was that simple, man. Johnny Rapansky. So all you had to do was be, be in his wake of him, and you were going to be a cool guy. So you pay attention, and you learn shit like that. And then, uh, then you fall in love. Let me ask you, can I ask you a question about, yeah. about, um, about your brother and your transformation? You were thinking about joining the John Burr Society. Oh yeah, when he came out there. And 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 then you listened to Dylan. He smoked weed. That opened up your consciousness. Yeah. Um, did your brother? Did did his comedy? Did it? How much did it change society? And how or how much was it a reaction to the to the scene of what was going on? Well, he was just saying things the way he saw them, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and he saw them from his viewpoint. Yeah. And he was into he was into gender and shit. He was into being fair to ladies long before that shit was popular. Uh -huh. He put me hip to it because uh -huh. I would say chicks and shit, which I still do. I don't give a shit. <laughs> if you're younger than eighty and you're a female, you're a chick, <laughs> and it, I don't mean no harm by it. It don't make you a lesser person. It's uh -huh. just what my way of fucking talking. Right. And uh, dudes are dudes. Yeah. And people that are into other genders and want to do shit together, I don't care what you do on your off-duty time. Yeah. That ain't got nothing to do with it. Can you read the scope? Can you pick up the goddamn target and tell the airplane where to go to shoot his ass down? Yeah, then fine. You can be married to another dude for all I give a shit. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be that way. you just got to be accepting of other people. And it's hard to be accepting of the people that don't understand you. It's very hard. My last, my last eight eight months in the service, I had a roommate who was from uh, Panhandle in Florida, man, and the dude never used anything but the N-word, anything. And he knew my feelings. He knew my feelings against that. And he respected me as a person. He knew, he knew, he knew that I'd had two court marshals in Alaska, and he knew that I would punch your fucking lights out if you fucked with me. So he, we were good roommates that way, but all he ever did was that. And it was his radio, but whoever would get back from the shower first could play the music. And if I'd play KGFJ, and, and the, he would call it the N-word music, really out to lunch, and he, on that one thing. But it was not manifested in any actions. It was just he grew up in that ignorant area with all that dumb shit, and I couldn't help. And I, I lent a guy, I lent a, a guy, a black guy, I lent him 20 bucks. And he says, you'll never get that back. I said, fucking Johnny Bolden will come looking for me. I said, I ain't gonna have to look for him. And the guy's name was Indian, part Indian for Christ's sakes, and he's using the N-word, yeah. you know? Because we're all something, we're all fucking something, man. The people from the Spanish Armada swam ashore in Ireland, all these black-headed people, where do you think they get these Irish with all the black hair? From the Norwegians? No, they were there, and who was fighting in Ireland? The Norwegians were fighting the fucking Danes. The Irish didn't give a shit about Dublin as a seaport. So it, it's all different things. And, and when you think, you know who I love? You know, I, I hope some of you people have listened. Thin Lizzy? Anybody hip to Thin fucking Lizzy? Boys are back in town. Bill the Knot, Bill the Knot, and Thin Lizzy. The boys are back in town. Guess who's back in town today? Them wild eyed boys who've been away. They were looking where you stay, who you could be seeing, and all that shit. Fill the Knot. He, he got uh, blended blood or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And he's up there singing about, I'm black Irish baby and pumping it out and shit. And everybody loving it because that's Ireland. And they had a Jewish mayor and they had a, a prime minister, Disraeli, who they sent over to England and he was a Jew representing Ireland. People got to understand this shit. You know, and people come down on the Jews. They hate the Jews. If it wasn't for Jews, I don't know where I'd be. I had so many Jews that still love me and still do shit for me. And, you know, a buddy is a buddy. It don't matter what he is or where he is. Or I got a buddy in the Crips. Big fucking deal. You know, he's on probation for a very realistic thing. I was talking with Dino and I said, what about? He said, well, it was this way. This guy, his chick had gone with this other guy. And this other guy having Dino's chick wasn't enough for him. So he had to come and rag Dino 
with a whole bunch of cheap talk about it. I got her now and this, that, and the other thing. Then, then the guy comes down, and Gino told me this himself, how it happened, because he, he's lucky he just got three years probation, I told him. The guy said, much like when the guy said to my grandfather, you know, I only wish he was the Irish flag. He rags Dino about all this bullshit, then he gets over by the doorway, and he starts to come toward him, and Dino could see the knife, you know, in the guy's thing, and he said, well, there was a baseball bat there, Pat, and I, I just took the bat, and, you know, I said, oh, cool. Yeah, and the guy went, I don't want to do it. But he got off with probation, but all he did was a natural thing. The man is reaching for a knife, I'm reaching for a bat. Bat beats knife. Gun beats knife. You know, there's a lot of things, and you got to know those things. So, uh, I have seen a lot of happiness from people who get off their high horse and, and start believing that they, they that, that hate people just because of what they are. And you don't have to preach at them, you just have to show them. You just have to show them where you are. Yeah, an example. An example? Yeah. Well, anybody, if you have a question, just feel free to jump right yeah. up. I uh, was wondering, you were there in the scene, the Vietnam War days. You saw the construction guys with the hippies. Oh, yeah. any, any recollection of, of, of what, what that was like? And Dumbest motherfuckers in the world. Okay. Yeah, Irish guys. Uh -huh. uh, I went back, I was voting for, uh, and actually we went to McGovern. Uh -huh. We wound up with McGovern. Uh -huh. Now, Mr. McGovern, they called him a wimp. They called McGovern a wimp. They got, see what happened to the guys who really called them Reagan Democrats. What happened to the Reagan Democrats was a bunch of stupid bastards like me who weren't smoking reefer. They weren't. They were into alcohol. And they got some overtime from the Chevy plant and the Ford plant. And when they got their overtime, Reagan was in there. So with their overtime, they began to think they were big, rich people. They bought a blazer. They started drinking that, uh -huh. uh, that foreign beer and shit, you know. And they started to... And they thought they, they were Reagan Democrats. So we come here, we're getting ready to go to Trinidad and Tobago. God damn it, do they know how to treat a visitor. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I'm here in my old neighborhood, and Irish guys I grew up with, and they're calling McGovern a wimp and shit like this. And I said, dude, I said, McGovern, 40 combat missions in World War II. Where's the fucking wimp? Reagan. Reagan didn't do dick in World War II. Yeah. He made these service film things like clean your dick after you get laid, or you might get the clap. You know, service things. What kind of shit is this? Reagan is what they call a celluloid hero, a phony bastard. And these guys thought they were all hot shit. They thought they were all rich Republicans. And he would get up there screaming about the welfare queens and the welfare queens. Mm -hmm. All code, all code messages for the black people and the brown people are gonna come and get you. <laughs> ah, hurry up, motherfuckers, I'm waiting. Oh, yeah. They have the dog whistle. That is a, such a bullshit yeah. thing, man. Right, the dog yeah. whistle. That, so you gotta pay attention and you gotta, yeah. you gotta stay hip to the jive. I call it being hip to the jive. And I have for a long time. And you had those 40s, you had the 30s with the tough thing. You had the 40s, which was juvenile delinquency. That was beautiful. Those were my best days as a juvenile delinquent from like age uh, seven to about 19 when the Korean War started. The Korean War broke up that old gang of mine. George used to sing that song, he'd say, uh, those, those narcotics cops are breaking up that old gang of mine. But it was the same way Korea broke up our old gang. Me and a buddy were planning on robbing a whole bunch of furs out of a fur store and shit. We had plans and everything and then everybody got into the service and shit like that. And when we come back, I had guys that went on the cops. I had buddies that went on the cops. I said, how can you be going on the cops, O'Brien, when you're doing the shit we do and you're gonna bust these kids for doing what we did? He said, well, that's 20 years and you get a pension. 20 years and you get a pension. Hey, you wanna hear about attitude? I just flashed on attitude with the cops because it was such a bogus trip in my neighborhood. My neighborhood was so fucking cool then I'd go back there and do it all again. I would do it all again. We, when you come out of uh, the bars, you're drinking. It's a night like this, it's hot and everything. So you're drinking them containers of beer and shit. And we're on the corner of 123rd in Amsterdam, and there's a UPS guy laying on a, uh, 
he's laying on a, a, a bench, because it's right where the park comes out on Amsterdam. And he's laying on the bench, and he's drunk as a billy goat, and there's a black dude laying on the other side of, of the fence to the park, and it was some spikes like this where you could reach through it. And this hand is coming up, and it's heading for the UPS guy's pockets. Mm -hmm. Now, there's about eight of us there, and O'Brien is on the cops now. He's on the cops. And you gotta carry your gun when you're off duty, right? So one of the guys says, hey, Jimmy, look at this man. Look at this guy. He's getting ready. You gotta, you gotta bust him. Now. So we all start reacting, Jimmy. You gotta bust this guy. So he goes over to where this dude is laying down and got his hand up like this. And he reaches through and he puts the gun right in the guy's fucking face. And he says, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And the dude lays there and looks up and says, Minding my own fucking business, what are you doing? Ah! Oh! Made our night! Ah! And we pointed at O'Brien and we had just a wonderful fucking time laughing and goofing. And then O'Brien says, Get the fuck out of here! And the guy gets up slowly, gets up slowly, and he says, I'm leaving. Ah! <laughs> That's why I loved my neighborhood. I loved my neighborhood. And learn so much, and it's a fortunate thing. Yeah. Any, uh, I think what we're going to do, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Any final thoughts for these teachers? And Patrick and I are going to stick around and take individual questions. You can come up, okay? And if you don't have any questions, you can go, and I'll see you on Google on Thursday, okay? All right. So, any final thoughts? For any th my thoughts are: I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for every person in this room and you're all going to do something. You're all going to help these children somehow. You're, and you have a, a little girl of your own already. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. No, it's a wonderful thing. And I can tell by the way you're treating her that it's wonderful, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. And I'm happy about the potential of all of you. I hope I might have given you a germ seed or something, anything to make you feel good about yourselves and about how you feel toward others. And I'll answer any question you want. I've got nobody I'll squeal on, but uh, I'll answer any question anyone has. I have no regrets. I'll, I'll answer that right now. I have no regrets. I would do it all exactly the same way. There's not a bit of scar tissue I'd give up, and uh, there's not a single guy that I sent to the emergency room who didn't have a coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to stick around. If you have a question, come on up. Um, and the rest of you, I'll see you soon. I'll see you on Google on Thursday. Oh, take the formula with you. Take my formula with you, please. Einstein's formula is, and I've said this on the air and I preach it, Einstein's formula is E equals MC squared and all that scientific stuff. My formula is simple. Music plus reefer equals brotherhood. <laughs> that's it. I'm, I'm happy to tell you that because it's that goddamn easy. Okay. Got my vote. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd run for Prez. If they, if they don't shape up, I will run for Prez. I'll do it.